Please be seated. The Lord be with you. So the Lenten season is in full swing. In preparation for Easter for 40 days, many of us choose to either give up something, as Jesus did when he practiced fasting in the wilderness, or to refocus on a Christian spiritual practice with a renewed sense of purpose, whether one surrenders something deeply valued or adopts new habits. Such activity is meant to lead one to consider anew the depth of God's love for his children. We're charged to consider where that love should lead us. Growing up, the practice during Lent was usually to give up sweets. And I remember having conversations with my peers about how daunting the next 40 days would be without Oreos and cupcakes. How on earth were we going to make it without Oreos and cupcakes? And though Lenten practices are meant to connect us closer to God as we walk the footsteps of Christ in a way, I can't remember having conversations with my friends about the spiritual breakthroughs that we may have experienced as a result of our self-denial. We believed it was necessary to give up something, but we weren't always successful in making the spiritual connections that were just as important. Spending this season focusing on what we're pushing ourselves to give up, rather than on what we hope to gain in our walk with Christ, defeats the purpose. The practices that we adopt during Lent, or during any season for that matter, can become formalities if we're not careful. It may be helpful to consider yourself a pilgrim on a journey, seeking presence in the moment, to discover more about yourself, more about your God, and more about your purpose that God may be calling you to fulfill in this season of your life. The Lenten journey is more about pilgrimage rather than mere tourism. Pilgrims unpack their baggage and park it for a moment, anticipating renewal and transformation. Tourists don't intend to stay where they are traveling to. Tourists may or may not unpack their bags. Living in their suitcases for a few days at a time may suit them just fine. They've simply come to see the sights, to get a glimpse of what life is like in some unfamiliar destination. But eventually, they return to the places from which they came. And as we journey on our spiritual pilgrimage with Christ, we should not anticipate a return to the places from which we've come. Our focus and sacrifices and breakthroughs should guide us to a different place, a better place. They should guide us closer to our Creator. But it has to begin with a sincere desire to know God more intimately. It must begin with a deep willingness to unpack our baggage before God. And it requires humility and vulnerability. In the Philippians passage, Paul speaks of his desire to know Christ more fully. He wants to be found in him so much to an extent that he shares Christ's very trust in God. He wants to know the power of his resurrection. He wants to have commonality by sharing Christ's death and sufferings. And this longing makes his past unimportant, easily able to be discarded. Then Paul acknowledges that he is not alive in that union to the fullest extent, though he knows that he has already been made Christ's own. What he describes is an upward call, which presumably continues to summon Paul to greater joy and love, overflowing with knowledge and insight. 
Paul shows the Philippians what it looks like to level up in Christ, how to set aside former things in order to strain toward what lies ahead, how to abandon old habits and create new ones that reflect more fully what they were indeed, that they were indeed faithful children of God, transformed by his love and grace. And this season, many of us live by this concept of leveling up, challenging ourselves to know Christ more deeply, to the extent that we can live more like him. Leveling up is about pressing on towards higher goals. It's about taking the next step in our faith journeys. But only you know what next step God is challenging you to take. Maybe for you the next step is addressing bad habits. Or maybe it's forgiveness. Forgiving someone who's hurt you. Forgiving yourself for the pain you may have caused someone else. Perhaps it's pursuing acts of mercy and piety more intentionally. Perhaps the next step for you is to learn more profoundly what it means to be a true disciple of Christ. Perhaps it's time for you to come to grips with what true devotion to your God looks like. In the Gospel reading for today, Mary of Bethany shows true devotion as she took a pound of costly perfume, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped them with her hair. The scene of this passage is so powerful. Picture Jesus having dinner with a number of guests, including Mary and Martha. But also seated at the table is their brother Lazarus, who only a short time earlier was dead. In the passage preceding this, Jesus revives his friend. And now he's here at the table, very casually enjoying the meal and the fellowship, not missing a beat. Can you imagine the amazement, the gratitude, the unspeakable joy of Mary and Martha as they gaze upon their brother seated at this table, alive and well? We are reminded here that death never has the final word. Now picture the anointing, the potential shock of the onlookers smelling the potent fragrance that filled the house. John doesn't share with the reader Mary's reasoning behind anointing the feet of Jesus, but the act speaks for her. Surely she was grateful for the miracle Jesus had enacted upon her brother. But Mary's gesture shouldn't be limited to a simple gift of thanks to Jesus for reviving Lazarus. Biblical scholar Jean Vanier suggests that she understood, perhaps uniquely, the depth and beauty of Jesus' love, that his love is liberating her love. And yet, quite unashamedly, we see in this moment that Jesus is also revealing his need for her love. In the foot washing following this passage, Jesus will wash his disciples' feet, as an expression of his love for them, as a way of drawing them into his life with God. And he will also ask them to repeat this act of service for one another. What Jesus will do for his disciples and will ask them to do for one another, Mary has already done for him. And this woman we are given a picture of what the fullness of true discipleship looks like. Her act shows forth the love that will be the hallmark of discipleship in John and the recognition of Jesus' identity that is the decisive mark of Christian life. Mary's act of discipleship in this story is that she knows how to respond to Jesus without being told. She takes initiative. She fulfills his love commandment before he even teaches it. 
She embraces his departure at his hour before he has taught his followers about its true meaning. In the anointing, she demonstrates what it truly means to be one of his own. She gives boldly of herself in love, just as Jesus will give boldly of himself in love. And some biblical scholars note his raising of Lazarus as the announcement of the fullness of God available in Jesus, and the fullness of life Jesus makes available for those who believe. Mary's anointing of Jesus following the raising of Lazarus is a companion to his act because it announces the promise of discipleship. That is, if in the raising of Lazarus, Jesus is fully revealed, then in Mary's anointing of Jesus, faithful discipleship is fully revealed. John's vision of a community shaped by love and grounded in relationship to Jesus is first enacted by a female dis disciple who by conventional standards has no claim to that position. Discipleship in John does not conform to stereotypical assumptions about the composition of his circle of disciples. The true disciples of Jesus are persons like Mary, whom he loves, who love him, and live out that love daringly. The story of Mary's anointing speaks to the notion that our faith must not be limited to a mere conscious and doctrinal understandings of Jesus. Our faith must extend beyond our minds to reach our hearts, our hands, and our feet. John does not tell us what Mary believes, and it seems beyond human comprehension that she could have understood all that would happen to Jesus and all that her actions evoked. Yet we see her an act of faith that resonates so deeply. Mary had the audacity to love Jesus in a manner that could have been perceived as outrageous and even unusual. But this is the kind of love that transcends. And perhaps for a moment, others can't understand it. But there is so much beauty in audacious love. So where is God calling you to love boldly? Lucy O'Brien, a communications expert specializing in international human rights and economic empowerment issues, understands audacious human love as a superpower meant to heal and transform our broken communities. In the spring of 1999, as she watched news coverage of the refugees fleeing the war in Kosovo, an irrational fear gripped her. This is going to be out of the news in two weeks, and I will forget, just like everyone else, she thought. That evening, she sat down with her 11-year-old son, Duncan, and told him about the Albanians being forced from their homes in Kosovo. They had witnessed their villages being burned down and had endured weeks of walking through the freezing mountain passes to refugee camps across the border. She then turned to him and asked what he thought they could do to support the survivors of the war. And he suggested they send toys to the refugee camps for the children who had lost their fathers in mass executions. Well, that was a wonderful thought, but how? She was a single mom with two kids working as a commercial actress, surviving on residuals that barely trickled in, and didn't see how it would be possible to afford such an expense. But then he turned to his mother and said, Mom, I have $200 in my savings account. We could use that. So she and her big-hearted son went shopping. 
Soon after, she discovered that Albania was in a state of anarchy. And with the resulting chaos and corruption, there was little chance the toys would end up in the refugee camps for which they were intended. There was only one way to guarantee their safe passage. They would have to be hand-delivered. And what she did next can only be described as a temporary loss of sanity or the beginning of a bizarre family vacation that has continued to this day. Over the next six weeks, they received their passports, went in for immunizations, and found someone to sublet her tiny Hollywood house for precisely one month so that she could put her rent money towards two airline tickets. Toting a cheap student camera and a fake press pass, they launched into what would be the most important trip of their lives. After they landed, thunderous fighter jets roared above them as they crossed the Adriatic Sea from Italy to an Albanian port town and a ferry swarming with the Italian Red Cross and a variety of relief groups. Surveying her surroundings, the reality of what they were doing suddenly hit her full force. She was going to a war-torn third world country with her son to deliver toys to refugees. Was she crazy? Somehow she knew this was one of the sanest decisions that she had ever made. So they made it to the camps. Her son handed out the toys. The children were touched and appreciative. But seeing her son love the children in the boldest way he knew, being a child himself, warmed her heart. The stories they heard in the refugee camps were devastating and not particularly appropriate for her son to hear. But what really shocked her was her own lack of awareness. In fact, she was outraged. And she could no longer afford the luxury of ignorance as her mind became saturated with the ugly truth about genocide and other human rights abuses as they continue to exist in our world today. Standing in the middle of a refugee camp with her son by her side, she vowed to do whatever it took to become a voice for all victims of human rights violations. And thus began an extraordinary journey as she traveled with her children to conflict zones in the developing world using photography and storytelling to bring awareness to human rights abuses, especially human trafficking and modern day slavery. And she has traveled to over 70 countries now for humanitarian work. And O'Brien says the greatest part of what she does is listening, allowing her brothers' and sisters' voices to be heard, and giving them a chance to share their personal stories, because all humans need to know that they matter and that they are loved. You see, bold, proactive love has power. The love that Mary had for Jesus, the love that Jesus has for us, the love now dwelling in us by way of the Holy Spirit has power. My brothers and sisters, God is calling us to realize the power that God has already given us to do his work. So this season, I encourage you to level up. Unpack your bags. Re-examine yourselves in Christ and let God challenge you to love more audaciously for Christ's sake. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.